Tons going on here in Marlins universe. First off, there has been a ton of international signings, international free agents. The Marlins have inked deals too. Also, Pablo Lopez rumors continue. Now the Cardinals are involved as well. We have a Sixto Sanchez sighting. And boy, oh boy, what a sighting it is. He's throwing. And it looks like throwing. Nick Fortes, he's called it out. He's been catching Sixto. And as well, we have a selfie to work with. Sixto Sanchez looking svelte, baby. Absolutely flames from Sixto. No nutty professor physique from Sixto at all. There is tons to dig into as we start to digest that the Marlins are having a second meeting with Yuli Gurriel, the first baseman, the former Astro first baseman. Tons happening. All going to be covered on today's Locked On Marlins. You are Locked On Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings from England and welcome to Locked On Marlins. This is your daily Marlins podcast. I, of course, am the host, Peter Pratt. Hit me up mainly on Twitter at Miami Marlins underscore UK. UK vibes. For those wondering, yes, I am based in the UK. No, I was not born in Florida. How did I find the Marlins? I went over on holiday, went to a ball game and absolutely love it. Fell in love with the Marlins there and then. Giancarlo Stanton hit a hit a massive home run. That got me going. Went straight to the team store, bought the jersey. I was all in at that moment. Around about two months later, the rebuild started. <laughs> More pain for me. Anyway, if you are listening, cast version, hit subscribe. Thanks for joining. If you are wondering, there is a YouTube channel. And it is, of course, called Locked on Marlins. Head over there. Head over there if you would like to see... The action and also uh, hit, hit, hit subscribe there too. Why not? Subscribers are heavily growing for that channel. Great to see our record, the record amount of views ever last week covering the Miguel Rojas trade to the Dodgers. Uh, guys, welcome to the show. It's Tuesday, the 17th of Jan. It's uh, just approaching 6 p.m. here in the UK. Uh, the Craig Mish, Barry Jackson collabo article in the Herald has just dropped. Digest that one. Prior to that as well, some rumors, some conversations that the Marlins are talking again with Yuli Guriel. It's actually harder to say that than, than I thought it would be. Yuli Guriel. There we go. That feels good now. Just need to practice it. But the Marlins at first base looking for... I'm not sure if platoon is the right way because Cooper Loop is fine. He's, they're, not, they're not looking to platoon Coop. Um, they just need some depth at first base. So I don't think it has to be a lefty, but in my opinion, they should be targeting a lefty. Guriel, uh, formerly with the Astros, uh, it's fair to say his 2022 was poor. Uh, you go on that, I did. Went look straight to baseball savant, as you do. What's the profile looking like? And it's a sea of blue. It's painful. It's It looks like all of the Marlins offensive guys, apart from Jazz, uh, in 2022. He would have been a perfect Marlin in 2022. The Marlins are interested in Guriel. Guriel may be interested in the Marlins. Cuban, 30 uh, of age. Doesn't sound like he's got a ton of suitors. Oh, boy, does this inspire you? It does not inspire me. It doesn't. It doesn't, guys. And you know, and I've been on this pod talking about it loads all through last year. Um, I'm still, I, I just... I don't understand. If that is the plan at first base, keep Lewin Diaz. Go and claim him. Lewin Diaz, league minimum though. Lefty, amazing in the field. Just claim him and just have him there as a, as a bench bat. It's totally frustrated me, this whole Lewin Diaz situation. And I mean, Lewin Diaz himself will be totally frustrated with every situation. He's been uh, claimed, traded. DFA'd so many times, it's absolutely ridiculous. And that's the problem. No no minor league option years for Lewin Diaz, unproven at the major league level. 
And so this is the situation. He is basically on the roster bubble all the time. Um, but for the Marlins, you know, could they just, is it a buy low candidate on Guriel? Maybe it is. And if you can get a cheap deal, minor league, maybe with a, an invited, I don't know, whatever the deal is, like they're not going to throw tons of dough at Guriel, surely at this point. Um, but again, going back to it, if all you're looking for is a depth bench first baseman, just keep Lewin Diaz. It doesn't, it's still, it still baffles me. Okay. They gave him a look at the back end of last year. <clears throat> they did. And it wasn't amazing. Granted, uh, you know, we'll take that. The defense is amazing. He's on league minimum. League minimum, though, lefty, defense amazing. Like, you can make do with that. Absolutely. And I don't think they'd look to, you know, be switching Coop out of there a ton. And particularly if they're looking at Jorge Soler in the DH spot, you know, they're going to lock him in there at DH. Coop's going to be at first base. We'll wait and see. Who knows? There's, there remains further rumors about what the Marlins are going to be doing. Is, you know, Coop uh, expiring deal this year, too? So the Marlins need to be really considering what the future looks like at first base more generally, more generally, not just now. And we'll wait and see what happens there. Sounds like there's there's definite interest. They're going in for a second meeting. Uh, let's see if they get a deal done. Let's not forget, guys, the Johnny Cueto deal. Still not official. Why? They haven't got room on the 40-man. 40 40-man 40 still full. They're looking to add another first baseman. They're looking to add a reliever as per... Uh, Barry Jackson, Craig Mish. Uh, just on that, let's talk about relievers briefly. Uh, if you haven't read the article, go and dig into it. There's tons of little news and, and, and nuggets, which is which is you know what we're looking for. Um, but the main things on the reliever market is Roldis Chapman mentioned him uh, last week or the week before. He was throwing. One team was there to watch him throw. We don't actually know what team it was, and we jokingly said it was the Marlins. The, the throwing uh, session happened in Miami, so you know two and two together, you come up with with four on that one. Um, but the Marlins haven't made an offer to Aroldis Chapman, uh, per uh, Craig Mish, Barry Jackson. So then at the moment, not in on him, haven't tendered an offer. That's not the right phrase, but you know what I'm saying? There is also talking about Alex Reyes. This, this has bubbled along all off season. It's bubbled along mainly because Sandy Alcantara, uh, has been pumping it. Why is he pumping it? It's because, uh, his, his agent is Alex Reyes, uh, brother, I believe. And so, Rightly, Sandy is pumping it, but rightly, Sandy is pumping it because the upside play with uh, with Alex Reyes is there. Like, there's a ton of upside there. He's obviously hurt in 2022. Sometimes you have to uh, buy on the upside there uh, for sure. We'll wait and see what happens in the reliever market. But, you know, for me, you know, the Marlins do need to address uh, the back end of the pen. You know, and, and as we dig into Dylan Floro, and again, we have to call out Dylan Floro, uh, a free agent after this year again. So the Marlins need to consider the leverage pen, not just for this year, but moving forwards. We know it's a volatile spot. We know the Marlins aren't going to throw a ton of dough at the, at the pen. Um, but at the same time, they need, do need to be looking ahead too. Um, you know, thinking about what the future may hold in that spot. It's such a critical inning. The ninth, we saw it last year uh, when Flora was down and hurt, how much of an impact it had on the club. Need to, need to address it. Could they get some sort of two, three-year deal maybe with Alex Reyes? I don't know. That's probably a little bit too risky for a club like the Marlins and their tight cost control situation. Um, but, but, you know, I think if they go down the Reyes route, then you'd be looking for one with a team option, maybe two team options in there. Would that be wild? I don't know. Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. But, you know, could really be the type of contract that would suit the Marlins giving them ways out if things go sideways, giving them tradable players if things go sideways in terms of the season itself. But a buy low candidate coming off injury, Alex Reyes, for me, fits the profile perfectly for the Marlins. Fits the pen. They are not going to spend huge dough addressing the pen. And with that being said, they have to take these chances, these shots. And look ahead, past 2023, when Dylan Floro right now projected to be a free agent, maybe the Marlins will get an extension done. I'm not certain on that one. I, I, I mean, the reality is if Floro is good in 23 and the Marlins are cooked by the deadline, then we know where Floro will be. Well, we don't. We know where he won't be. And he won't be in Miami. I think that's the most likely situation there. Uh, if, uh, if the season continues on, much like all of the rest of the recent uh, full-length seasons. 
Okay, guys, let's transition now briefly to talk about Pablo Lopez. Uh, he has been a name and a pitcher that has been linked for some time. Back at the trade deadline to the Yankees, back at the trade deadline, perhaps to the Dodgers, back at the trade deadline, maybe to one or two others. We now are into the offseason. It's then rumored uh, the Twins. He was going to the Twins, but according to every animal in every state uh, in, uh, in, in, in the U.S., he was uh, going to the Twins. He isn't with the Twins yet. Uh, we, that, that trade didn't happen. Um, I don't know. Maybe the, the reporting was a bit wonky on that one. But Pablo Lopez, I think, remains the main arm that the Marlins are looking to try and deal and looking to get something significant back. The Twins, I think, still is a good fit. Uh, we've, uh, you know, we've also talked about the Red Sox, too. I think the Red Sox is an interesting fit, too, albeit uh, the Red Sox, uh, as you start to engage with some of their fan base, the vibe I get from the Red Sox is they're, they're in a phase right now that I wouldn't describe as all in. They know what the division is. Starting to, I think, you know, get some of their, their, their prospects in and build around them and start to build for the future. So Pablo Lopez on a two-year, uh, two years of control, perhaps isn't quite the right fit for the Red Sox as maybe they're kind of just taking stock right now. The St. Louis Cardinals has, have, have emerged. Here's the thing I would say about the Cardinals. Uh, a, uh, a very well-run ball club. Secondly, the reporting uh, will be absolutely on point. We know that. Why is that? Because Craig Mish... Uh, not, not only is he amazing as a Marlins reporter, but also he has got some nice connections over in with the St. Louis Cardinals. And so I'm pretty confident that if Pablo Lopez uh, is dealt, or anyone for that matter is dealt to the Cardinals, that Craig's reporting will absolutely, it will be Craig Mish first on it, quote tweeted, reported by every uh, every national guy out there. Pablo Lopez to the Cardinals. Let's just think about that first. For me, it uh, makes a ton of sense. Ton of sense uh, on that one. Uh, Pablo, I mean, listen, Pablo Lopez to any ball club makes a ton of sense. He's earning less than $6 million this year. He's got another year of control. It's, it's wonderful value for a pitcher of Pablo when healthy uh, of his quality. It really is. And so that is the situation. What we did here in this article from Craig as well, uh, today is that the talks have cooled, whether they've cooled because the Marlins are deciding that they don't want to sell, which I don't think is the case, but maybe some of the deals they had building uh, with other clubs around Trevor Rogers and Edward Cabrera, they have cooled in all uh, by all accounts. Not quite sure what that means. The reality is Edward Cabrera saw a great, um, great post on, on Twitter. I think it was from Eric Cross. So, um, uh, someone can fact check me on that one, but a great Twitter thread there about Edward Cabrera and how he could be due a massive breakout. He was talking about it from a fantasy perspective, but equally fantasy becomes reality. And uh, I've been high on Edward Cabrera all along. I absolutely love Edward Cabrera. I love his profile. Sandy 2.0. That's, that's the name. That's the nickname. That's what we're rolling with. And I think if healthy, he absolutely uh, has it in the locker as they say. The health is a concern with Edward Cabrera. It is these niggling injuries that keep happening with Eddie. And the reality is no minor league options either on Eddie. It's now for him. He needs to stay healthy. He needs to put it and on the field. I think the Marlins should build around Edward Cabrera personally. I think the Marlins should be looking to trade Pablo Lopez. He is the, he is the right guy to trade at this time. As painful as that is to say, he's an absolutely world-class First-class dude, top pitcher. I think he's gone away from the stirrups, though, by the way. So that is a bit of a knock, in my opinion. But uh, Pablo Lopez, just a top. Still young as well, guys. This is the other thing. If you trade Pablo Lopez to a team like, for example, the Boston Red Sox, for example, the St. Louis Cardinals, which is possible, uh, for example, the Los Angeles Dodgers, if you trade Pablo there, yes, it's two years of control, but these clubs... They are not afraid to get extensions done with dudes. It's not like the Marlins where they'll just run out their uh, controllable years and then it's free agency or likely trade them before. These clubs, they aren't afraid to extend dudes. 
It would not shock me wherever Pablo gets dealt, and I think he will be dealt in the near term. It wouldn't shock me if we end up with a Luis Castillo situation where he ends up signing an extension with that club, committing to three, four, five years. I don't know. What I'm seeing from the Marlins is they aren't willing to extend Pablo. That's what we've seen. That's what we felt all the way back to last arbitration period, which was in the middle of the season, which was kind of funky. But the Marlins went all the way with Pablo in terms of arbitration. Uh, and for me, that was probably a clear signal that that maybe that they weren't um, looking to extend him and, and keep him around long term. We'll wait and see. Are the Cardinals a good trade partner? We'll wait and see on that. They do have a few interesting outfielders, quite a lot of outfielders, I would say. Um, it depends what kind of profile they're looking for in terms of offense and defense. For me, I, I and I kind of pumped it out there yesterday and maybe the day before too, two names that have always been in my mind. Ramon Laureano remains in my mind. I'm just stunned that he hasn't been traded. I'm, I'm you know, not stunned, shocked. I mean, maybe. But for me, like the Marlins and A's, Laureano to the Marlins just makes a ton of sense, particularly if it's a relatively low cost situation. Maybe they're trying to overcharge for it. I don't know. Eli did kind of pipe up and said they're looking for prospects and the Marlins don't want to send any to Oakland. Boy, oh boy, if the Marlins, like if they're afraid to upgrade their, their major league roster by keeping hold of prospects, of which the farm, let's be totally honest, and Baseball America agrees, is in a middling at best state. Yes, Yuri Perez is in there. But let's be totally honest. Once you go past Yuri Perez, the rest of the farm looking, you know, versus other farms, it starts to get vanilla pretty quick, pretty quick. Khalil Watson, head's gone. He needs to be better in 2023. Jacob Berry, oh boy. I mean, the profile looks interesting. We'll wait and see. Can't play third base. Is he a first base DH? But can he hit? We'll wait and see. I don't want to go off on that tangent, but a great, if you haven't listened to it, Baseball America um, had a top 10 prospects. They've done a whole series of this uh, covering a lot of the farm systems, but a top 10 in the Marlin system. And listen, they didn't hold back. The guys were were not holding their punches. Um, you know, yes, they loved Uri Perez. Yes, they liked a lot of Max Meyer. Um, but beyond that, there was some choice words to be said uh, for, for many of the Marlins prospects. So back to the original point I was making. The Marlins should be looking to make a deal for Ramon Laureano. Like for me, it just fits the perfect profile. And he's a buy-low candidate too, with multiple years of control. Fits the brief. I think there's still time on that one. But for the Cardinals and Pablo Lopez, we'll wait and see. The Marlins still need to think about third base. They still need to think about first base. We're going to wait and see what they do with shortstop and second base. I think they've got enough middle infielders now on this 40-man. So... I'd be surprised if they went either, you know, right at the middle in terms of that. The other question then is, with all of these middle infielders brewing and no center fielder right now, should the question be asked about Jazz Chisholm Jr. playing center field? The profile, the speed, the athleticism. It, I mean, listen, the Marlins had Jonathan Villar out in center field a few years back on opening day. So they're not afraid to do it. And equally, you know, square peg, round hole, I mean, I think Jazz could do it. Here's the thing with Jazz. In my opinion, this is just me uh, and my opinion around this one. Uh, he wants to play shortstop. We know that. And I think, in reality, I think that's where he's going to end up this year. If he doesn't, and uh, Jazz is very active on Twitter. Very active. He's one of the most active players and one of the, definitely one of the most active Marlins players for certain. And he's not afraid to answer fans, pipe up, give his opinion, whatever it might be. He isn't. And we love that. That's why we love Jazz. Um, and the way he operates on Twitter, for certain. Jazz, I know, has been asked multiple times on Twitter directly, do you think you could play center field? What do you think you could be like at center field? Could you play center field? Jazz Chisholm, the type of guy he is, um, I'm, I'm confident, like, he's the type of guy that would respond either way. And listen, Jazz could play anywhere, in my opinion, and he will believe that, and I actually believe it too. For him not to say anything about center field and answer that, I think says more than actually answering the question. I'm wondering whether the Marlins have seriously considered that situation. They've seriously thought about moving Jazz Chisholm into center field. It would solve a problem right now? Absolutely. 
I'm not sure what it would mean in terms of the infield, but perhaps you then go Gene Segura, second base, Joey Wendell, shortstop, which the Marlins seem comfortable with, and Jazz in center field. Could it be an option? I'm not sure. Listen, Jazz wants to play shortstop, and I think that is his first wish. And I think if the Marlins believe in Jazz at shortstop, then that should happen because you need impact sticks at shortstop these days. Let's finish off. Um, I mean, like I said, this is a bumper episode. We're already 20 minutes in, guys. So we're running long. I'm locked on on a solo pod. I feel like I need a drink, but I haven't got one with me. Not a beer, by the way. I'm still on dry jam. Um, but let's talk about the international signing period that just opened up a few days back. And the Marlins, they went for zero marquee name. There was no Victor, Victor, Victor Mesa specials, no kind of throw in. All of do at one of the really top top uh, rated guys. This was about this was about numbers. This was about quantity and quality. We have to say there's some names and there's some players in there that I think the profiles look really really interesting for certain. Particularly uh, the guy that they took. There's a two way player from the Bahamas. Uh, looks very interesting. I think I, I've seen after they're saying maybe he'll split his time like 70, 30, 60, 40 in terms of offense. Or position player to pitching, uh, but wait and see. Those two way guys are always exciting. Clearly, you know, the best player in Major League Baseball, uh, the biggest example of two way players uh, and how they could make it work. Um, but for me, what got me or where my mind went to was okay, they're not going to throw two, three and at one specific guy, they're going to go for quantity. I went back to look at some of the you know, more recent names taken away, uh, Victor, Victor Mesa, but some of the recent guys that um, are either in uh, the big leagues now or have been um, very recently to see what kind of signing bonus they had. And when I went through it all, you know, you look at like Sandy, Uri Perez, Edward Cabrera, Pablo Lopez, Sixto Sanchez, uh, Brian De La Cruz, all of these guys was signed three, four hundred grand. Most of them around 200, 100 grand. Sixto Sanchez, 30 grand. This is it. You don't know at this point. You don't know. And there's no sure things. There's no need to throw the money. The approach here is if you like a couple of the tools, you like the profiles, spread the pool and acquire as many as you can. The Marlins have a brand new complex in the Dominican. It is looking wild. It's looking wonderful out there. That's the type of place you want to play baseball for certain. The other final point on this, and Jazz agrees, I guess, because uh, I, I called it out on Twitter to say the Miami Marlins have become the destination organization for Caribbean baseball players right now. I think of the six uh, Caribbean guys or Bahamian guys uh, that were signed, three of them were signed by the Marlins. So the Marlins, A, like the Caribbean guys, and also the Caribbean guys like the Marlins, and that is the jazz effect. You've got jazz in the organization, face of the organization, one of the faces of Major League Baseball in the Miami Marlins uh, organization, and I think that is an attractive proposition for uh, countrymen, uh, for certain. Ian Lewis, uh, we know as well, he's on the up and up as well, will also be representing Great Britain as well as jazz. So, there's a big Caribbean, there's a big uh, Bahamian vibe running through the Marlins right now, and I love to see it, and I think it's it's nice. It's a nice wrinkle to have for the Marlins, and I think it will help them in the future for all these new Bahamian studs coming up. You know, They're going to be turned into the Marlins because they know they're, they're going to be familiar faces there, and there's going to be people and names they can turn to and get some good reviews. Final piece of the puzzle then, guys. Speaking about international guys, Sixto Sanchez, baby. It's fair to say he's been heavily written off. Heavily written off. I mean, he hasn't thrown a pitch at any level in two seasons. We haven't seen him since the COVID 2020 year. The shoulder injuries, in injuries flared up in 2021 camp. It was mismanaged through 2021, ending in surgery. All the debacle of throwing at 10 feet, 11 feet, 45 feet. Sixto, I think he was badly managed by the Marlins in that situation. Uh, the PR around it was not that well managed. They tried to bridge the PR situation in the offseason. Uh, I remember just like a sit-down documentary with uh, Kyle Seelaf trying to get the PR spinning, trying to get it that, hey, this is Sixto Sanchez, and he wants it. He wants it, and he's 
determined to make it. I didn't see him again in 2022. But what I must say, we'll finish on this. Sixtos, and there was a recent Twitter space that wasn't on it, but I believe there was reports that he was 40 pounds overweight. 40 pounds. He was in Sherman Clump territory, I believe. However, Sixto Sanchez drops drops a couple of things on IG, so they say, so they call it. First off, there was there was a video of him throwing Nick Fortes, also saying that he recently caught a bullpen uh, of Sixtos and he was looking sharp, he was looking fluid, he was looking nice. Great to see. That video is probably the best video I've seen in two years of Sixto Sanchez. And he's not, this isn't a full bullpen. He's not giving it full gas, but it just, it did. Motion-wise, he looked the loosest we've seen. So that was great to see. Secondly, he then drops a random selfie, looking like he's about to go out on the night, on a night out. You know, we don't begrudge him that. But he was looking trim. Sixto you know, he's always had that kind of, you know, build, let's say. But for me, he was looking trim. And I think it was unfair to say he was 40 pounds overweight. He was no Sherman Clump. It was Sixto Sanchez, vintage Sixto Sanchez. And here's the thing, guys. If Sixto Sanchez can get healthy again in 2023, boy, oh boy, it would be a huge boost for the Marlins. They will treat it, they will treat it really carefully. They have to be so careful with Sixto. But as fans, we have to look back to 2020 and remember just how exciting it was when Sixto was on the mound, full gas from him. It was just great to see. If Sixto can make it back and as a starter, great. Also, a lot of people have talked about it. What about coming out of the pen? Listen, Sixto, I think, will, I mean, he'll just be happy to be back up at the, at the major league level in 2023. That's the way things play out. Um, any role that the Marlins need from him. But to that point we said earlier, Dylan Floro, expiring deal. The Marlins will be looking for a leverage arm. And I think, you know, a lot of people have said this, that maybe Sixto could be that guy. Clearly his value is greater as a starter. And I think the Marlins would absolutely love the return. But Jazz talked about this uh, on MLB Network around when the playoffs were going was we've got so many many stud arms and if you don't trade any of them then a couple need to transition to the pen and give them some some leverage innings there you know what would Braxton Garrett be like coming out of the pen I mean boy oh boy we've got enough we've got tons of lefties as it is but you know what would Braxton Garrett give out of the pen what would Edward Cabrera give out of the pen if required not that I'm saying you Edward Cabrera should be coming out of the pen but you know, what could Max Meyer give out the pen if required? There's so many starters. And if everyone is healthy and fit, then that creates situations where some guys may need to transition and go and take the eighth and take the ninth. We'll wait and see. Guys, this episode has run way too long. Thanks for making Locked on Marlins your first listen of the day. It's great to be back with you guys. I feel like news is imminent. Johnny Cueto's deal will be imminent. Um, as maybe will be a signing of Yuli it is tough to say. So I have a sense that news is about to drop. We'll wait and see. Pablo remains the main guy that the Marlins are looking to move uh, from the rotation and look to try and acquire a bat or two. We'll wait and see on that one, guys. As always, uh, if there is news, there will be Locked on Marlins. I look forward to seeing you soon.